I realized that the creature was beginning to ascend my legs, to climb my body. Even then, what it was, I could not tell. It mounted me, apparently, with as much ease as if I had been horizontal, instead of perpendicular. It was as though it were some gigantic spider. A spider of nightmares! A monstrous conception of some dreadful vision. It pressed lightly against my clothing, with what might for all the world have been spider's legs. There was an amazing host of them. I felt the pressure of each separate one. They embraced me softly, stickily, as if the creature glued and unglued them each time it moved. Higher and higher, it gained my loins. It was moving towards the pit of my stomach. The helplessness of which I suffered its invasion was not the least part of my agony. It was that helplessness which we know in dreadful dreams. I understood quite well that if I did but give myself a hearty shake, the creature would fall off. But I had not a muscle at my command. As the creature mounted, its eyes began to play the part of two small lamps. They positively emitted rays of light. By their rays, I began to perceive faint outlines of its body. It seemed larger than I had supposed. Either the body itself was slightly phosphorescent, or it was of a peculiar yellow hue. It gleamed in the darkness. What it was, there was still nothing to positively show. But the impression grew upon me that it was some member of the spider family. Some monstrous member of the like of which I had never heard or read. It was heavy, so heavy indeed, that I wondered how, with so slight a pressure, it managed to retain its hold. That it did so by the aid of some adhesive substance at the end of its legs, I was sure. I could feel it stick. Its weight increased as it ascended, and it smelt. I had been for some time aware that it emitted an unpleasant fated odor. As it neared my face, it became so intense as to be unbearable. It was at my chest. I became more and more conscious of an uncomfortable wobbling motion as of each time it breathed, its body heaved. Its forelegs touched the bare skin about the base of my neck. They stuck to it. Shall I ever forget the feeling? I have it often in my dreams. While it hung on with those in front, it seemed to draw its other legs up after it. It crawled up my neck with hideous slowness, a quarter of an inch at a time, its weight compelling me to brace the muscles of my back. It reached my chin, it touched my lips, and I stood still and bore it all while it enveloped my face with its huge, slimy, evil-smelling body and embraced me with its myriad legs. Whew, man. That's some scary stuff right there that you'll find in this book, The Beetle by Richard Marsh. This is your Sunday Penguin for the day. So welcome, my friends. Welcome once again to Stately Vaughn Manor. Blah, blah, blah. Stately Vaughn Manor <laughs> and your Sunday Penguin, The Beetle by Richard Marsh. So this is kind of a horror classic. It's that horror classic you probably have never heard of. Maybe you have. Uh, the Beetle by Richard March, which came out in 1897. Famously, this was more popular and outsold Dracula initially. Uh, it, it didn't hold on to that uh, popularity uh, because Dracula is way better. But The Beetle is very interesting. And so I wanted to talk about it. Now, this is a uh, book from the Penguin English Library. I don't know, in fact, I don't think that this is available as a Black Spine classic. I kind of doubt it. I've certainly never seen it. Let me know if I'm wrong, if you know. But this is the only way I've ever seen it from Penguin, from the uh, Penguin English Library. 
it's a nice little book. And it is Penguin, so, you know, it counts for a Sunday Penguin. And I'm glad, because I did, I did want to talk about this one. Now, there are some good things and some bad things about this book. Uh, one of the good things is that you probably don't know what the plot is, which I'm not going to spoil too much. I'll tell you a little bit of the setup, but that's it. Because you have here, probably, a unique opportunity of reading a classic horror novel without knowing anything about it. You know, Dracula, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. You basically knows, know what those are about because there have been a million movies about those books. I don't know that this has ever been made into a movie. If it has, I've never seen it. I don't think so. So to call it a classic work might be stretching things a bit. But, you know, Penguin publishes it, so sure. Um, it is extremely interesting, though, because of the stuff that's in it and when it was written. Like I said, it came out in 1897. It has a lot of the same kind of stuff that Dracula had as far as boundary pushing scariness and sexuality and some other stuff going on in this book that your average Victorian would find uncomfortable and really creepy. This does have a really, really creepy monster in it. The beetle, the creature uh, that is the main threat in this book, is really weird and really creepy. Uh, and it's unlike anything else that I can think of off the top of my head that you would find in a Victorian novel. It's a really weird monster. Uh, so the bare bones of this story, uh, it's basically about, basically, there's a lot of stuff going on in this book. But basically it's about Paul Lessingham. Now years ago, Paul Lessingham was in Cairo and he was kidnapped, basically. He was led away by a beautiful woman and ended up being kidnapped and captured and forced to be a part of this cult, the cult of of Isis, and he was a prisoner of the mysterious woman of the songs. And all the crazy stuff he saw when he was forced to be a part of the cult of Isis, uh, human sacrifice, and a bunch of stuff that could have been a lot worse, or more uncomfortable at least, than that. Mesmerism plays a big part in this, it was very frightening at the time. Uh, to the Victorians. Imagine somebody taking complete control of you by hypnotizing you and getting you to do a bunch of stuff that, you know, you would never do, you know, if you were in your right mind. But, you know, maybe it might be a little fun if someone made you do it. Anyway, there's a lot of that going on in here. There's a big mystery at the heart of this. And interestingly, a lot of this mystery is never clearly uncovered. The main monster, it's an interesting creature. It's an ancient Egyptian monster. Now, Lessingham escaped, you know, but the way he escaped caused this creature, the beetle, this ancient Egyptian monster, to go, at, to go after him for vengeance. Why? That's part of the mystery. Now, what this thing is, is never really clear, really. We never even know, really, if it's male or female. Uh, it's a little androgynous, which is, of course, terrifying if you're a Victorian. There's a bunch of terrifying stuff. Like I said, there was the mesmerism, which is a part of this creature's great power. It could hypnotize you and get you to do its bidding, you know, which is really scary. This creature, you know, like I said, is it a man or a woman? What the hell is this thing? What kind of powers does it have? It seems to have some pretty strange powers. There are hints of homosexuality going on in this book, maybe, you know. Pretty scary stuff to those uptight Victorians. There's a lot of stuff. And so as far as pushing the boundaries, 
This goes farther than Dracula does. On the other hand, it is not as well written as Dracula is. Um, the plot is really interesting, but it is not as well plotted as Dracula. This is divided into four parts. Each of the four parts is narrated by a different narrator. Uh, so it's kind of reminiscent of the woman in white uh, and sort of Dracula itself, where you have the multiple narrators. Uh, you have a romance in this. You've got a love triangle in this. Uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff in here that you will recognize uh, because it's very much a melodrama. A really interesting one, though. Uh, this guy, Richard Marsh, as far as I know, this is the only book of his that I found in actual print. And he wrote a ton of books. I don't know if any of them were any good or if any of them were as good as this one. I'm going to read more of them, though, because... Thanks to the magic of ebooks, you can read this guy's books. In fact, the first time I read The Beatle, well, the only time I've read The Beatle so far, wasn't through this book. It was an ebook. Uh, and you can get a bunch of this guy's books as ebooks, free ebooks, uh, or really, really cheap at least. So I'm definitely going to check more of Richard Marsh out. He seems kind of a. This is very much proto pulp, you know, this is early pulp stuff. Uh, you can tell from the overblown section that I read you the style of how some of this was written. And yet, a lot of this is really effective as far as how creepy it is. The monster in this book, he is a very dangerous monster. Never really seems as dangerous as Dracula, though, to me. Dracula always seemed like he was a little bit more on top of things. But this monster has a lot of power and is just so creepy. It's such an icky monster. It really is. Um, and so it's interesting for that. It's a really interesting look at Victorian horror. And it's interesting that this was as popular as it was. It's, this pushed a lot of buttons, I think. Uh, the Beetle by Richard Marsh. So... Definitely, yeah, check this book out if you're interested in horror and the history of horror or Victorian literature, uh, any of that stuff. It's an interesting book. So there you go, The Beetle by Richard Marsh, your Sunday penguin for the day. I will catch you next time. I've got something else I should have up later on today, but it's about comic books. So, you know, the six of you that are interested in that kind of thing, catch that later on today. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow for the Robert E. Howard Show. Okay, guys, I will catch you next time.